I want to welcome everyone to this special briefing challenging super PACs before the Supreme Court. My name is John Bonifaz. I serve as the president of Free Speech for People, uh, and we're proud to be sponsoring this briefing for all of you and to have a distinguished featured speakers, Congressman Ted Lieu and Professor Jeffrey Fisher of Stanford Law School. Uh, I, I want to say at the outset, we're going to be recording this call uh, for future distribution. And we will also have a Q&A session after the presentations. Congressman Liu will need to join us, at, leave us after his opening remarks, uh, but we will continue after the presentations with a Q&A session and we'll explain how you can ask a question at that time. I also wanna let everyone know that Ben Clements, our board chair, senior legal advisor, unfortunately had a, a late breaking conflict and is not able uh, to join us uh, today. Uh, but with that, I'll, I'll get started to introduce our opening speaker, Congressman uh, Ted Lieu. Uh, we're honored to be representing uh, Congressman Ted Lieu as the lead plaintiff uh, in this case, Lieu BFEC, which is now uh, before uh, with a petition for Supreme Court review. Uh, and Congressman Ted Lieu is a leading champion in the United States Congress for the fight for our democracy. He readily stepped up in 2016 to serve as the lead plaintiff in this case. He represents the 33rd Congressional District in California in U.S. House of Representatives. Uh, and he's serving his third term uh, in Congress, currently sitting on the House Judiciary Committee and the House Foreign Affairs Committee. Uh, we are proud to represent him and the other plaintiffs in this case. And with that, I will yield the floor to Congressman Liu. Thank you. Uh, thank you, John, uh, for your leadership and for everyone uh, on this call today. I'm uh, very excited uh, that this case is progressing. Um, thrilled to be the lead plaintiff suing the agency that has oversight over me, so that's always fun. Uh, but in all seriousness, I think this is a great case. And as all of you know, the Supreme Court actually didn't decide the issue of whether you can have unlimited contributions to super PACs, which has really caused a flood of dark money uh, into our political campaign system. It was a lower court decision. Uh, we believe that decision was decided wrongly. Uh, we're suing to get that decision overturned. And even though the Supreme Court uh, is uh, generally conservative, you've seen Chief Justice John Roberts join with the liberal justices on a number of high profile cases. Um, it's possible he could do that again. And certainly the system can't be any worse than it already is now. And so that's why uh, we're bringing this case. Uh, we hope the court uh, will hear it. Uh, and then uh, decide the right way. Uh, in terms of um, the advocacy, I think it's important to just continue highlighting this issue because a lot of people mistakenly believe that Citizens, Citizens United uh, caused the flood of a lot of this money and that's, that's just not accurate. It is this lower court decision. And so we also want to build public sentiment. Uh, I do believe Abraham Lincoln had a right when he said that public sentiment is everything with it, nothing can fail. Uh, without it, nothing can succeed. And just educating the American people on uh, what actually happened with Citizens United versus this lower court decision and how we can uh, go ahead and try and change it, I think would be helpful. And again, thank you all for all your advocacy and look forward to continuing working with you as we try to uh, reform our campaign finance system. Thank you, Congressman. We, we know you have a tight schedule. We appreciate you joining us. Uh, and appreciate your leadership at this critical moment in our history. Thank you. I can stay on for their professor's comments. Okay, wonderful. So our, our next uh, featured speaker is Professor Jeffrey Fisher of Stanford Law School. He's the co-director of the Supreme Court Litigation Clinic there and serves as the lead counsel at the Supreme Court stage uh, in this case for us. Uh, Professor Fisher is a leading authority on U.S. Supreme Court practice. He has argued over three dozen cases before the court and served as co-counsel for the plaintiffs in Ogrebefell v. Hodges, in which the court held that the 14th Amendment guarantees same-sex couples a right to marry. 
Uh, we're honored to have Professor Fisher leading uh, this team before the Supreme Court, and I give the floor to you now, Professor Fisher. Thank you. Uh, well, thank you. Uh, before I say anything else, I want to reciprocate uh, the honor uh, to be working with Free Feast for People and the other group of lawyers uh, who've been helping on the case all along. And it's an honor to represent Representative Liu and the other plaintiffs in the case. So uh, thanks for including me with the effort in, in this effort. And it's a, uh, it's a real privilege to work with all of you. Um, I thought what I would do is take uh, a little bit of time here and just summarize for, for, for those of you on the, on the call, uh, basically what our, what our argument to the Supreme Court is for hearing this case. Uh, we filed our petition, it's, 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 it's now uh, at the court. Uh, and we'll find out probably this fall whether the court will take the case. And so let me just tell you what, what we're telling the court and why, why it should hear it. And it really boils down to four, four points. Um, and the first point, probably the most important point, uh, is, um, is, is, is just the basic fact uh, that a lower court, the, the United States Court of Appeals for the DC Circuit, has held that a federal statute is unconstitutional. Uh, that is probably the most common reason for U.S. Supreme Court review. Uh, as we note in our petition, uh, the court has what it's, own, what it's called a strong presumption of review whenever a lower court invalidates a, uh, an act of Congress. And that just stems from the court's basic uh, respect for coordinate branches of government and the basic reality that if a act, carefully considered act of Congress is going to be invalidated, it should come from the US Supreme Court, not from some lower court. Or to put it another way, and perhaps less negatively, uh, the question whether a statute is constitutional needs to be decided by the US Supreme Court, not by a lower court. Um, and uh, that's true regardless, really, of what the government might say later in the case. The, 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 the federal government has not filed its brief in response to our petition yet. Uh, and in fact, we do not know what the Solicitor General on behalf of the government is going to say. Uh, we do know uh, that uh, for decades, the government has had a view that it will make any reasonable argument uh, in general in support of an act of Congress. And it, that's its job is, defend, is to defend acts of Congress. So that's the ordinary position the government would take. And we obviously hope that's what the government says here. Uh, but if for some reason the government uh, agrees with what the agency has been doing the last uh, several years and not uh, defending the constitutionality of the statute, it still wouldn't matter. And in fact, in many ways, that would just make it more imperative that the Supreme Court grant review uh, to decide whether or not the statute is constitutional if, 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 even, if even the executive branch uh, decides that it doesn't want to uh, follow uh, the law that Congress passed in a, in a past administration uh, enacted into law. Um, the second point uh, that we make in our, in our petition is that um, not only has an act of Congress been held unconstitutional, uh, but, uh, but the consequences of that are extremely serious and severe. Uh, and I think, you know, Representative Liu and, and, and others uh, on this call can, can, can elaborate, and, and many, many listeners just may know already for themselves how, how, how important and harmful uh, super PACs have become. Uh, but, um, but you know, against the backdrop of a, of a world where the Supreme Court, for example, has granted review in recent years, uh, where lower courts have struck down uh, statutes that uh, prohibited depictions of animal cruelty uh, or scandalous trademarks, you know, if those warrant Supreme Court review, then obviously um, uh, a, a statute that really defends the integrity of our democracy and makes elections fair uh, should, should, should warrant Supreme Court review. So the importance of the, of, of the case is, is, is manifest. Um, and third, uh, and this is where we spend most of the time in our filing, uh, uh, it's not just that an act of Congress has been held unconstitutional, it's that the lower court is wrong. The lower court has gotten the law wrong. And that's what uh, requires not just Supreme Court review, but ultimately, we think, reversal and a reinstitution of, uh, of the uh, contribution limits to, uh, to super PACs. And there's two basic points we make here. Uh, the first is just the basic fact that the court, in terms of its campaign finance uh, decisions, going all the way back to the landmark case of Buckley versus Vallejo in 1976, has always distinguished contributions um, 
to candidates and related entities on the one hand from expenditures uh, for political advertising or speech uh, that, that candidates or groups might make on the other hand. And what the court has said is that expenditures are, are, are highly protected by the First Amendment because you are speaking and directly contributing to political dialogue and debate about elections. But contributions, on the other hand, are only a marginal form of First Amendment activity. Um, and certainly the amount of a contribution does not really speak uh, very directly or meaningfully uh, in terms of political debate. It shows support for a candidate or a position, but that's really all it does. Uh, and it's not the same as speaking directly. Uh, and so the first fundamental error that the lower court made was uh, just simply not putting enough uh, weight on the fact that this is a contribution limit uh, that we're defending here, not, uh, not a limit on expenditures. And the court has traditionally upheld contribution limits um, uh, to candidates uh, and to other uh, related entities uh, to prevent corruption. And that's exactly what the law here is designed to do. So, so our position is really in keeping with what the court has always done traditionally uh, with respect to campaign contributions. And more, our second point um, about the lower court decision is that, the, is that the court just got something wrong about Citizens United. Uh, what the court said is the court said, look, we understand that contributions and expenditures are different, but Citizens United seems to box us in and require us to invalidate this law. Uh, but that's just wrong. Uh, and the first reason why it's wrong is because Citizens United is a case about expenditures. It's not a case about contributions. Uh, the law that the court invalidated in Citizens United said that um, corporations could not make certain kinds of campaign expenditures. And the Supreme Court said, well, no, that's highly protected First Amendment activity. And so therefore it's protected. Uh, it didn't say anything about contributions. Uh, the leap that the lower court made was uh, there, there's a passage in Citizens United where the court said independent expenditures, which is, a, which is a term of art in campaign finance law for expenditures that are not directly coordinated with candidates, cannot themselves corrupt. And so what the, what the DC Circuit said was, uh, well, um, if, if expenditures from an organization like a super PAC cannot corrupt, then contributions to such an organization by definition can't corrupt either. And that might sound to the ear, if you don't think about it very hard, uh, logical, but it's actually just wrong. Uh, and so uh, one of our co-counsel, Al Alshuler, has written a wonderful law review article pointing out, uh, you know, imagine that, uh, uh, that a, a politician said, uh, for me to do this for you, please make a big donation to the Red Cross. And so there wouldn't be anything wrong with the, with the money the Red Cross is spending for all kinds of good reasons, but that contribution would still be a corrupt contribution. And, and in fact, the federal government um, on the criminal side has prosecuted cases involving donations to super PACs, involving those kinds of corruptive deals. Uh, and so the, the logic that the DC Circuit tried to pull out of Citizens United um, is, just, is just incorrect if you stop and think about it. Uh, and so uh, we don't challenge Citizens United in this case, and we understand that there's a majority on the court uh, that, uh, that presumably still, uh, still, still thinks Citizens United is correct. Uh, but, but you can take all that as, 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 as right and still say Citizens United just doesn't apply in this scenario. That's what our argument is. And then finally, uh, the last thing that we say is that um, the court should act now. Uh, the court is always interested in asking itself the question, is this the right case to take to decide this issue? And we say that yes, this is, um, and probably for the obvious reason that the sooner the court decides whether or not uh, contributions can be limited to organizations uh, that, that act like super PACs, the better. Uh, the corrosive effects of our democracy have already gone on for near a decade now. And unfortunately, um, this is the first time the court has had an opportunity to look at this. Uh, when the DC Circuit first issued this decision, um, the federal government declined to take the case up to the Supreme Court because uh, it said in an internal memo, uh, we don't think this decision is going to be terribly important and so we're just going to let it go. Well, obviously nothing could be further from the truth. And unfortunately, it's taken about a decade to get a case up to the court. But now that we've done it, uh, we think it's really, really imperative that the court take this opportunity to decide the issue. Uh, and by way of timing, we think it's also, um, we also think it's also good from the court's perspective because 
um, it wouldn't be able to decide this case in time for the 2020 election, but it could decide it right on the heels of the 2020 election and set the ground rules for elections going forward in a way that doesn't require any kind of sort of emergency or accelerated uh, thinking. So hopefully the timing along with everything else um, uh, works for the court and, and we look very much forward to, uh, to further briefs being filed in support of our petition and then responding to the government when it ultimately files and hope the Supreme Court will pick up the case. Thank you, Professor Fisher. Uh, our next speaker is Ron Fine, Free Speech for People's legal director, who's been helping to lead uh, this effort from the outset many years ago when we started this case. Ron? Thanks, John. I'll give the background on this case and its genesis, but uh, first on behalf of myself, John, and our board chair, Ben Clements, I'd like to thank the rest of the legal team we're, of course, incredibly grateful to Professor Fisher and his colleagues, Professors Pamela Carlin and Brian Fletcher, as well as the students at the Stanford Law School Supreme Court Litigation Clinic for leading this petition for certiorari. And I'd also like to highlight the members of the legal team that helped us bring this case through the lower courts over the past few years. Uh, Professor Lawrence Tribe of Harvard Law School, one of the nation's foremost scholars of constitutional law. Professor Albert Alshuler of the University of Chicago Law School, who's a leading expert on the law of corruption. Professor Richard Painter of the University of Minnesota Law School, and former chief ethics counsel to President George W. Bush. Brad Deutsch, Malcolm Seymour, Andrew Goodman, and Benjamin Lambiot of the law firm of Foster Garvey. And in addition to this legal team at the Supreme Court level, we also benefited in the initial stages of the case from the assistance and advice of Ambassador Norman Eisen, Stephen Weisbrod, and Ann Weissman. So here's how the case was born. In November 2014, Free Speech for People, in partnership with Harvard Law School and with Professor John Coates at that school, convened a symposium called Advancing a New Jurisprudence for American Self-Government and Democracy. We brought together prominent constitutional law professors and lawyers who were interested in finding ways to move the ball forward after Citizens United. And at that symposium, one of the panelists, Professor Tribe, suggested that the DC Circuit's uh, speech now decision was more vulnerable than people commonly understood, and that the Supreme Court might well reverse it if given the chance even if the court was not willing to revisit Citizens United. So Professor Tribe connected us with Professor Alshuler, who had for the first time articulated how the speech now decision fundamentally misunderstood how even quid pro quo corruption works. Over the course of 2015, we worked behind the scenes to prepare the legal strategy and assemble the case. In 2016, we put together a bipartisan group of plaintiffs led by Representative Ted Lieu, uh, we're privileged to have join us today, a Democrat of California, Senator Jeff Merkley, Democrat of Oregon, the uh, late Representative Walter Jones, a Republican of North Carolina, and three 2016 congressional candidates from both major parties, Zephyr Teachout, a Democrat in New York, John Howe, a Republican in Minnesota, and Michael Wager, a Democrat in Ohio. And on their behalf, we filed a complaint before the Federal Election Commission. In that administrative complaint, we named 10 super PACs from both major parties as the respondents. And all of those super PACs had accepted six-figure or even seven-figure individual and corporate contributions. We asked the commission to enforce the Federal Election Campaign Act's $5,000 limit on contributions to political committees. There was no doubt that these super PACs that we'd named had accepted these enormous contributions there was no doubt that the contributions violated the limit that Congress had passed. But of course, we didn't expect the commission to enforce the limit precisely because of the speech now decision. Our strategy, rather, was designed to raise the constitutional question of whether the limit that Congress had passed could be enforced against super PACs. Recognizing that this case would need to spend its initial stages in venues that would stick to the speech now ruling before we'd be able to bring it to the Supreme Court. And as we expected, the commission dismissed our complaint, citing speech now. So we then filed a lawsuit in November 2016 in the federal district court in Washington, D.C., challenging the commission's decision. As we expected, the district court also dismissed our complaint, citing speech now. We then appealed to the Court of Appeals for the D.C. Circuit. And we're grateful to U.S. Senators Sheldon Whitehouse, Richard Blumenthal, and Maisie Hirono, among others, for submitting an amicus brief in our support at the D.C. Circuit. But as we expected, the DC Circuit affirmed the lower court's decision, again, citing speech now. 
Now, for the first time, the issue is being presented to the U.S. Supreme Court, which is in no way bound by the D.C. Circuit's Speech Now decision, and which has the opportunity to correct a disastrous 10-year experiment created by that lower court decision. We urge the court to seize that opportunity. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Ron. Uh, before we move to the Q&A session, I'll just close with these uh, remarks. The discussion you have heard demonstrates the serious threat to our democracy posed by super PACs. While super PACs are far from the only problem in how our elections are funded, it is impossible to overstate the significance that a victory in the Supreme Court would have in this case. As you have heard under speech now, super PACs can take contributions in the millions, while candidates and political parties can only take contributions in the thousands. One of the many perverse results of this is that a super PAC supporting a particular candidate typically far outspends the candidate's official campaign and the political parties. Super PACs have become more important than the official campaigns and candidates are fully aware of where the money comes from. The reality of super PACs has turned the theory of speech now on its head. Quite the opposite of what the speech now decision tells us, in fact, candidates are far more likely to be corrupted from the massive contributions to their supporting super PAC than by the much smaller contributions to their official campaign. And super PACs don't just outspend the official campaigns and parties. They dramatically outspend corporations. In the last 10 years, super PAC spending to influence elections has overwhelmed, uh, sorry, has, has in the last 10 years, super PAC spending uh, has overwhelmed the, the, the spending of small uh, contributors. In fact, super PAC donations comes from a small number of extremely wealthy individuals, not corporations. The unlimited corporate spending on elections unleashed by Citizens United has itself been disastrous, but the emergence of super PACs in the wake of the speech now decision has proven to be much worse. And there are no external constraints on super PACs. Unlike corporations, they don't have to worry about a backlash from shareholders, customers, employees, or the general public who may object to their political spending. A, a victory in the Supreme Court by eliminating super PACs would dramatically alter the way our elections are financed going forward from how they have been financed for the past 10 years. But a victory would also upend the widely accepted notion that our current corrupt system is locked in and unchangeable. And it will help advance some of our other efforts to challenge the improper influence of big money in our elections, which you can learn about on our website at freespeechforpeople.org. I want to thank again, Congressman Liu and Professor Fisher for their leadership and for joining us today. And we will now move into our Q&A session. Oski Buckley, our Director of Administration and Finance, will explain how you can ask a question. Oski. Great, well, thank you, John. And hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. So to ask a question, if you are joining us online, please select the raise hand option at the bottom center of your Zoom window. And if you're joining us by phone, please select star nine on your keypad to virtually raise your hand. We will then take you off mute so you can ask your question. So please feel free to select either of those options now if you do have a question. Thank you. Great, thank you, Oski. I see that uh, Pamela has a question. Uh, Pamela, go ahead. I'm not sure if she's uh, off mute. Okay, now I can. There she is. Okay. Uh, thank you, uh, John, and Free Speech for People team for putting this briefing together. It's it's uh, it's exciting to review, and uh, and I'm excited about the future of your your actions and your work. So my question is, why do you think then Attorney General Eric Holder did not seek review? of the DC Circuit's uh, speech now ruling in March of 2010. Uh, Professor Fisher, do you want to answer that? 
Hi. Uh, yes. Well, well, to, I, I should preface my answer by saying that the two-page memo uh, that summarizes that decision-making process is available online, and it's cited in our brief. So, uh, so I'll do my best to summarize it. But, um, but uh, you can go read for yourself at least what the memo says. Uh, and what, and, and primarily what the memo says is that. Um, I think there were two reasons. Uh, I, I referenced one, which is that uh, by the government's assessment, when SpeechNow was issued, it did not anticipate that the invalidation of the statute as applied to independent expenditure only groups uh, was going to be significant. And so, um, as I said earlier, it's a big deal whenever an act of Congress is invalidated, but, but uh, the government occasionally uh, will make the assessment that um, that the invalidation of the statute, at least uh, to the uh, particular scenario that the lower court has identified, isn't sufficiently important or isn't yet sufficiently important uh, to warrant seeking Supreme Court review. So that was, the, that was mentioned in, in the memo. And then the other thing that's mentioned in the memo was that the Citizens United decision was brand new at the time. And so the, the, the government itself thought it would be worthwhile to see how um, how things played out in light of the the new uh, rubric under Citizens United as well, and so um, you know the only thing I'll add to that is that is that what we now know is that um, there really is no good reason left for the Supreme Court not to hear the case. We know that it has in fact turned out to be an enormously important question, and we know uh, on reflection uh, that Citizens United really doesn't have anything uh, directly to do with this issue. Great, thank you, uh, Pam, for that question, Professor Fisher. Another question came in uh, via the chat from Fran asking, what is your prediction about the position of the different justices? Is there a swing vote? And I'll start with you, Professor Fisher, and then also bring Ron into that question. So you know, I, I, don't, I don't like talking about the court a whole lot on a justice by justice basis. Uh, because they are a collective decision-making body. Uh, I think that anyone who looks at uh, Citizens United and other re recent campaign finance decisions can see uh, that, that Democratic appointed justices tend to be more solicitous of Congress's authority in this area uh, than Republican appointees. Uh, but as I said, the court through broad majorities over the years has upheld contribution limits. So in my own mind, I'm, I, I, I view our petition as speaking to really all of the justices on the court who accept that basic framework established in Buckley. Uh, there are, there's at least one justice, Justice Thomas, who, said, who has said he does not accept that framework. Uh, but, um, but other justices on the court, like Justice Alito and the Chief Justice, along with um, the Democratic appointees, have all accepted and applied that framework in the past. And we can hope uh, that Justices Gorsuch and Justice Kavanaugh would respect that precedent as well and apply it. Uh, so, you know, we're trying to speak to a broad coalition on the court. We're not just, um, we're not just talking to any one particular justice. Thank you. And Ron, do you want to weigh in on that question? I would just add that some decisions over the past few weeks have illustrated that sometimes justices can surprise you if you uh, were imagining rigid preconceptions. And so, uh, like Professor Fisher, I think that we're addressing all of the justices of the Supreme Court, but that they, uh, they can surprise us sometimes. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have a question from Bob. Uh, Bob, go ahead. I think you're still on mute as well. I would like to ask uh, how this uh, case relates to dark money. Uh, Ron, do you wanna start there? So dark money uh, is a, a phrase that is commonly used uh, to refer to contributions to groups uh, such as 501c4s, which are not required to disclose uh, their spending. Uh, super PACs, as at least that term is conventionally used, uh, do uh, need to disclose, I'm sorry, the, to disclose their donors. Super PACs do need to disclose their donors, although in many cases their donors might be um, dark money groups or uh, other entities where it's hard to trace back the money originally. The key point here that we're addressing is not so much disclosure. Uh, we're not 
focused on whether we know the identities of the donors. Because in the case of these, you know, multi-million dollar contributions to super PACs, we do know the identities of the donors, but that still has a, a tremendous corrupting influence. So this goes far beyond uh, simply trying to improve disclosure. What, what we want to do is uh, have the Supreme Court uphold the limits that Congress passed to limit the amount of money that can be contributed to these super PACs in the first place. Thank you. Professor Fisher, do you want to add anything on that? No? Okay. Our next question is from Stephanie. If you're still there, Stephanie. Okay, I was just unmuted. So either for Ron or Professor Fisher, what would be the significance of a Supreme Court ruling in your favor on the overall impact of court precedent on money and politics? Professor Fisher, do you want to start? Yeah, I'll start and I, I think Ron, Ron, would be well positioned to amplify. Um, in a sense, a ruling in our favor would not be terribly dramatic in terms of the court's campaign finance law. As I've said, the court has already said that contributions to candidates can be limited, and the court has already said that contributions to groups that are closely affiliated with candidates and therefore pose similar risks of corruption uh, can be limited. Uh, so in one sense, what we're asking for is a very modest um, application of already existing law to this slightly different fact pattern uh, that we're presenting to the court. Uh, from another vantage point, this would be a significant decision, though, because uh, the super PAC phenomenon that has emerged after speech now has become um, a funnel for uh, enormous contributions and enormous problems with respect to uh, corruption in our political system. So on, in terms of that way of looking at things, it would be a significant and important decision that the court would issue uh, by reinstating, in effect, uh, the statute that Congress passed years ago and saying that it applies to, uh, to political committees formed in the, in, in, the, in the shape of a super PAC, just like other political committees. Um, and maybe I'll hand it off to Ron at that point to talk about kind of ripple effects or a broader perspective on campaign finance um, in general. Okay, thank you, Ron. Are you on uh, mute? Thanks, I, I would agree with that and add that besides the fact that super PACs are right now the dominant if not overwhelming form of essentially political slush fund uh, in federal elections, uh, such that uh, reversing the speech now ruling would itself have an enormous impact on the financing of federal elections. I think it would also give hope more broadly because there is uh, sometimes a sense of, of dejection uh, that the Supreme Court is uh, hopeless and is uh, never going to uh, take positive steps uh, in this area. And I think that by presenting a case where all we're really asking the court to do is apply its own past precedent uh, to this novel scenario where a lower court has uh, gone off the rails uh, and yet had such a tremendous impact on our elections, a victory here would, besides its own impact, also uh, help spark uh, broader possibilities of, of what might be achievable as we uh, enter into this new decade. Great, thank you. Uh, it looks like we have a question from Peter. Peter, go ahead. And you might still be on mute. Okay, yes, I had, I didn't quite understand the, uh, the distinction between dark money versus super PAC uh, money. Uh, and I know the dark money that for some reason you don't need to disclose the donors and in super PACs there's a need to disclose donors. I mean, I understood that, but does that mean that dark money uh, can be given to super PACs in which case <laughs> I don't understand, uh, is that the venue through which dark money gets funneled to campaigns or do they have some other route which can go around super PACs? Ron, do you want to take that? There are many different ways that uh, wealthy donors and the operatives who, who work with them uh, do route political money. So I don't want to say that there's one way of doing it, but it is not uncommon for uh, a 501c4, which is, uh, again, um, often the, the vehicle for so-called dark money, uh, to then give to a super PAC. 
Um, so the 501c4 is uh, an IRS designation that uh, describes what's a, an organization that's a social welfare organization. And it is not supposed to spend more than half of its money uh, for political purposes. Uh, that is sometimes maybe widely uh, not enforced, uh, but in theory, it, it's not supposed to be the primary activity of such an organization. In contrast, a super PAC is a political committee. It can spend 100% of its money for political purposes. So the reason that a wealthy donor might give to a 501c4 rather than a super PAC um, is in large part to hide uh, their identity uh, in that contribution. Um, there are, of course, separate issues uh, legally uh, involving the disclosure requirements, and uh, that, that's an ongoing area. But the key thing is right now, there are no limits on how much money can be contributed to any of these types of organizations, 501c4s or, or super PACs. Uh, and so uh, what we're trying to do is uh, reestablish the congressional limits that limit the amount of money that can be contributed uh, and that will immediately uh, create an improvement by, by limiting the amount of money going in. And then th there will always be uh, some cleanup to do in terms of ways that uh, wealthy donors may try to, to work around the system. Uh, as with any sort of white collar area of law, there are uh, clever workarounds that are attempted and that is the ongoing struggle of campaign finance reform. But right now, the major problem we're facing is that the law that Congress has already passed is not being enforced because of this lower court decision speech now. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Professor Fisher, we have a question from uh, Fran. If the rich can't contribute so much to super PACs, will that money just go elsewhere and where? Do you want to take that? Uh, I can try. Um, uh, I'm not one of those uh, people myself, so I can't exactly speak for them. Uh, but um, you know, I, I think it, I think it's it's sort of what Ron was just saying, which is obviously there are going to there are there there are always going to be people who are seeking to influence elections and and unfortunately influence them uh, in 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 underhanded or corrupt ways. Uh, all we're asking for here is for uh, the measure that Congress has already enacted to solve that problem uh, be properly enforced. Uh, it may well be that, that people look for other avenues, but that, that's not really an excuse to block the most obvious and problematic avenue right now. Uh, and so, uh, so I guess the only thing I will add is, is there is no readily available alternative right now. Otherwise, we, one would imagine it would be used. Uh, and so maybe, maybe it's one of these things where the proof is in the pudding. If you look where the money is going right now, it is through the super PACs. And that is why we think this case is so important. Thank you. And, and Ron, there's a question from John in, in the chat. Isn't there a case that the current campaign finance rules violate the Constitution because they deprive small donors of equal representation? I know that's not this well, case, but not that's that general point. Yes, there's uh, not a Supreme Court case uh, saying that, although it would be uh, great if there were. Uh, there is uh, a, a legal argument uh, to be made, not in this case to be clear, but to be made uh, elsewhere, that the uh, current campaign finance system uh, may violate uh, the Equal Protection Clause in that it uh, has a, a wealth discriminatory impact. That That's not an argument that's involved in this case, uh, and it's not an argument that um, we're uh, intending to you know, present in the Supreme Court uh, here to be very clear, uh, but it is one worth thinking about for uh, the long term uh, for another day. Great, thank you. And Peter, you had an additional question. Oh, go ahead. I think you need to unmute again. I'm not sure if you there, there we go. Out. Yeah, so. So I know Congressman Liu and I think the others, of course, I think pretty much Democratic, if I'm not mistaken, but are are support are support this, and they're bringing the, their their names are on this uh, this uh, um, movement to the Supreme Court. But uh, how generally, what is the response of Congress about this end run around their own rules? Right. I mean, is it that is the funding system and the support of people in Congress so corrupt that 
very few of them? Or what's the sense in Congress about support of this, um, this uh, petition to the Supreme Court? Uh, who wants to take that? Ron, do you want to start? And... Uh, I, I, can, I can take a, a partial uh, crack at, at that question. Um, obviously, we can't speak for uh, all or even most of the members of Congress. Um, uh, as I mentioned, um, we uh, launched this case with uh, actually a bipartisan group of plaintiffs. Unfortunately, the uh, late Representative Walter Jones uh, passed away during the pendency of uh, the litigation. Uh, and we received amicus support from a, a group of U.S. senators and, and expect to receive that at the Supreme Court level as well. Uh, the members of Congress obviously differ in their uh, opinions and approaches and so forth, but we, we do know that certainly in the House there's been a widespread support for um, campaign finance reforms uh, in general and in some cases quite far-reaching. And the key thing is that Congress doesn't need to do anything at all uh, as a body uh, in this case. They've already passed the law. Um, they don't need to take any, any further action. If we win, the law springs back into action. So uh, the necessity of congressional action uh, is in many cases uh, urgent, but in this case, uh, Congress has already done what it needs to. Now, if we win and then Congress wants to refine or, or improve the limit that it passed uh, before, uh, that would be uh, great. Um, but in the meantime, Congress doesn't need to do anything because it's already done the right thing. And it's only the courts that are in the way at the moment. Well, how many, how many congressmen or senators actually support it, though? I mean, that wouldn't, isn't that an important thing to know? I mean, do any, for instance, Republican senators seem to report it either or support it either openly or at least behind closed doors? I can just jump in on this. I mean, we've not canvassed the views of Republican senators on the speech now ruling, but I can say that in a number of surveys of elected officials and former elected officials, there's widespread view uh, that they don't necessarily like participating uh, in the process of, of raising funds, and many do not agree uh, that super PACs should be able to circumvent existing contribution limits that they've uh, enacted. But I, I, I do agree uh, with with Ron's closing point there that the that the courts are, are mainly the the D.C. Circuit Court and Speech Now is the one that created this problem. This was not created by the Supreme Court. It was not created by Congress. Uh, it was a ruling that the D.C. Circuit issued and now needs to be reviewed by the Supreme Court. Professor Fisher, do you want to add to any of this discussion? I'll just say two, two quick things in addition. Uh, one is, is that uh, Peter might be asking a question kind of from the, the other way around in the sense that the typical case as it goes to the Supreme Court where, a, where an act of Congress has been invalidated doesn't have anyone from Congress speaking up. Uh, for the very reason Ron said, which is that the law was already passed by a Congress and taking any formal position going forward is really kind of, um, it, it's, 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 it's not necessary uh, to, the, to, to the case. So the fact that any congressmen uh, uh, or senators are speaking up in this case is significant. And we'll just have to wait and see how many will take formal, formal views on this and sign amicus briefs or the like. Uh, the second thing that I would say is that um, we do note in our petition uh, that if you're asking particularly about Republicans, that, that, that various Republicans, including our current president uh, during the 2016 campaign, uh, decried super PACs as corrupt. And Lindsey Graham is another, uh, another uh, Republican elected official who has said the same thing. And so, uh, so we, we've, we've noted that in our petition as well. And so at least the, the arguments we're making have been echoed on both sides of the aisle, as Ron has said. Great, uh, thank you. Uh, so I I'm going to just close with a question to you, Professor uh, Fisher. You know, you've been taking many cases before the Supreme Court over the years, and many people come to you uh, with their cases that they'd like you to take on at the uh, lead counsel level before the Supreme Court, and you obviously can't take them all. Why did you decide uh, to take this case at our request? What was it about this case you decided to take on? Uh, well, uh, in some ways it was summarized when I summarized our petition. Um, the importance of this case is, is so glaring uh, 
Uh, and, and for anybody that lives in this country and cares about our democracy, uh, you want to have uh, the campaign finance regulations that Congress has enacted be properly enforced. And we've li now lived for too long already in a world where that's not been happening. And we start, and, and, and the effects are uh, very harmful. And so, um, so that was the first thing for me is just, just the importance of the case and the importance of the issue. And then um, when I got talking with Ron and got to know more about the case and all the people who've put so much time and effort into it, uh, it was also apparent to me that this, is a, that this is the right case at the right time to take up. Uh, and so, uh, so I think all those things point in the direction of the Supreme Court being, uh, you know, being t t giving a very serious look to this and hopefully reviewing, hopefully hearing the case. And I'd love to be a part of it. Um, and I think that, and, and maybe I would say the last thing is anytime a Stanford Law graduate reaches out to you, as Ron did, I have to give a special audience in that respect as well. Great. Thank you. Well, again, we're honored to have you serve as the lead counsel for us in this case at the Supreme Court stage. We very much appreciate you joining us. And thanks again to Congressman Lou as well uh, for his opening remarks. Thanks to Ron Fine, our, our legal director. And thanks so much to all of you uh, for all of your critical support that helps to make this work possible. You can stay updated on this case and all of our work on our blog at freespeechforpeople.org. As Professor Fisher indicated there will be some briefs filed soon in support of our petition for Supreme Court review and you can learn more about that uh, in a couple weeks via our blog uh, and we of course will keep everyone updated on further developments. So thank you all again for joining us and stay safe. <laughs>